Welcome, y'all. Glad you're here. Uh, this is uh, our upcoming campaign and, and series for the fall. You'll be hearing more about it in weeks to come. Just get that in your brain. Get it on your calendar. This is going to consume us as a church uh, in the best sense of the word, consume, for about 10 weeks. And I'm going to preach about it. And we're going to study about it on Wednesday nights. And we're going to have meals around it. And it is going to be a culture shifter for us as a church. So be praying for that as I have been and, be, and, and begin anticipating the coming of this new series. Today is the last week in the book of Genesis. Next week is a standalone Labor Day, I guess you will, sermon. It's not about Labor Day. It's a surprise. You have to come uh, next week to find out what it's about. But it will, it, will be, it will neither be about Genesis, nor will it be about our new series. It's going to be a one-week standalone service. So this is it. Last week of, of Genesis. Kind of sad to see it go. I'm deeply appreciative and, 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 and thankful for the book of Genesis, all 50 chapters. I hope you've gotten um, a lot out of it. As, as, as is usually the case, the pastor probably got the most out of it. So, uh, bittersweet time, but today we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. I want to begin by talking... Explaining, telling you about some of my favorite movies. This isn't going to be a sermon about movies, but I'm going to tell you about a few of my favorite movies. And there's a point to this. The point is, there are a lot of movies that have a theme of redemption in them. Now, one very simple definition of the word redemption would be this. The act of saving or being saved from sin and evil. Not a lot of movies about being necessarily redeemed from sin, but, but, but certainly from evil, which I suppose encompasses sin, right? So redemption, the act of saving or being saved from sin and evil. Redemption in the movies. Some of you all know that like my, my, my go-to favorite movie is, uh, is White Christmas. We're gonna, it's, it's a silly little musical. We're going to just set that aside for a moment and not talk about that. Although, although there, is, there is a redemptive uh, theme throughout that movie. What are they saving? In fact, they're saving uh, Christmas. Uh, but we'll put that one aside. I want to tell you about three other of my favorite movies involving the act of saving, because I love a good movie about a man um, sacrificing for the woman that he loves. Now, there are, there are numerous, many, countless, in fact, examples of, of a woman sacrificing for the man that she loves. But I prefer the other way around because I'm a man, so... So that's, those are the, the stories that I gravitate towards. So maybe you've seen some of these movies. If you're a cinephile, uh, these are not like probably in your mind great movies, but in my book, they're great movies. One of them is a movie that probably nobody saw. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was in the early 90s, and it was called When a Man Loves a Woman. When a Man Loves a Woman. Well, maybe some of you have seen it. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen When a Man Loves a Woman. All right, some of you have. All right, so the movie is this. The movie is about um, Andy Garcia really, really saving Meg Ryan out of um, addiction and alcoholism and all the complicated aspects of, of that. And there's a minor theme in the, later on in the story where she really saves him, redeems him, but... But Andy Garcia redeems or saves his wife out of that scenario. When a man loves a woman, uh, second of my three favorite movies um, would be La La Land. Uh, some of you have seen that in the last few years. And there's a, de a definite, definite redemptive theme in that movie. It's sad, but it's real life, right? The, what happens is Ryan Gosling saves Emma Stone uh, from her insecurities, um, from her lack of confidence, 
Uh, she's thrown in the towel. She's not going to try to chase this dream anymore. And he pulls her out of the depths of that, and, and then she has extreme success. And it's really a sad ending, right? Um, but nonetheless, it's a story of a man sacrificing um, for the woman that he loves. My third favorite movie, you should see these if you haven't. My third favorite movie is Castaway. Do you remember that movie? Yes. What was the name of the fictitious friend? Do you remember? Wilson. Yes, the, the, the volleyball or tetherball or whatever it was. I think it was a volleyball. Right? Um, Wilson. Yes. So, so, so in the movie Castaway, um, Tom Hanks and Helen Hunt, um, Tom Hanks doesn't really save her. But here's what he does, and it's really quite profound and moving. In fact, all three of these movies are kind of really super sad. Uh, he, he, he doesn't really save her, but what he does is he makes the ultimate relational sacrifice in order for her to be happy. But to make any sense to you if you didn't see the movie, but, but that's the case. And, and, then, and then it is a story about being saved, right? I mean, he is on a desert island, uh, in need of being saved. Um, so all three of those stories are tragic, but it's not the tragedy that draws me. Maybe that pulls at my heartstrings a bit, but what really draws me, it's the story of redemption. The story of someone being saved and someone actually being a savior. In life, there's all sorts of examples of people being saved. Being saved from drowning, being saved from abuse, being saved from financial hardship. Every one of us in this room has, has, has needed to be saved at some point in our lives from, from various and several different types of, of difficulties. So the story of the Bible, see where I'm going, the story of the Bible is a story of, of redemption. So today we're going to look at this final story in the book of Genesis. We've been talking about the story. We're going to unpack it one more time. We're going to look at redemption one final time in the book of, of Genesis. Quick review of Joseph, just in case you've missed a few weeks or you haven't been here before. You remember Joseph? He's most known in, 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 just in people's uh, uh, historical remembrance uh, as being the, the kid who had the, the colorful coat, the coat of many colors. It's one of the most well-known Bible stories uh, internationally, I suppose. Even people that aren't Christians or, or don't, don't go to church. And so Joseph... He was a young boy who was a victim of human trafficking. Uh, they, his, his older brothers, they sold him into slavery when he was a boy. Let's not clean that story up. Uh, it's, it's as brutal as it sounds. And now, in today's story, in, in chapter 50, at the end of the book of Genesis, now, decades later, uh, Joseph is a ruler in Egypt and his lowly brothers arrive on the scene and their fate is subject to, to his mercy. The mercy of, of his hands. Uh, he intends to do them no harm having forgiven them for, for all of their wrongdoings. So that's the, back, that's the backdrop. Let's jump in and Read Genesis chapter 50, beginning with verse 15. I'll read out loud and you follow along silently. When, Joseph, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us now, now that, now that dad's dead. It, it may be that that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. 
say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin. We don't really know if, if the dad really said this, but this is what he's telling. Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And then the, brother, the brothers continue. They say, and now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers, the 11 brothers, they, they came and they fell down before him. They're, they're seriously in fear for their lives. Perhaps, perhaps Joseph has, has stayed his hand all these years waiting for Papa to die and now he's going to be brutal toward us. Verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants, no longer your brothers. We'll, we'll merely serve you. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You recall there was a famine, seven-year famine, and, and many people throughout the world, in, including the, the, the family that would un, one day be the nation of Israel, there was, a, there was a famine, and many people throughout the world would have died, except that, that Joseph led Egypt to create this, this massive, massive uh, plan to storehouse food so that he might feed the hungry. As for you, you meant it for evil, God, he meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, Joseph comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So redemption. Redemption is a story that runs throughout the Bible. But what some of you may not realize, what we don't oft talk about, at least not often enough, is that redemption is the story that runs throughout the Old Testament. We call it the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this story, Jesus, he comes to earth and he lives a sinless life and then he dies on the cross to pay a penalty that we actually owe because we're the guilty parties because we're the sinful human beings. He pays the penalty that he doesn't have to pay um, and then having been buried he defeats death. He, he reanimates his body. He comes back to life. And he walks the earth for several weeks. And then he ascends into heaven. He's at the right hand of, of, of the Father. He is preparing a place for you and I where we will go one day. That's the story of the gospel. That's the story of redemption. The uh, the big book that I bring up here sometimes uh, called Systematic Theology. It's just a book. It's not like the Bible. It's just a study book. But, but Wayne Grudem wrote it. And I like to sometimes throw his, throw his definitions of words out there in front of you. So we looked at a, at a really simple definition of, 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 of redemption. Here's a, here's a more theologically astute definition of redemption. It's Christ's saving work viewed as an act of of buying back sinners out of our bondage to sin. Some of us used to be slaves to sin. Some of us sadly still are. Jesus redeems us out of that. He redeems us out of this bondage that we're under, uh, that, 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 that Satan has over us. And so, redemption, Christ's saving work, Viewed as an act of buying back sinners out of their bondage to sin and to Satan. But what I said, what I said was that, 
Redemption is a theme that runs throughout the Old Testament. And when you read this, and when I read this to you, we think of the New Testament because it's all about Jesus. And so why would Pastor Randy say that redemption is the story that runs throughout the Old Testament? I, I will tell you that if I didn't see the story, the gospel story, the story of redemption in the Old Testament, I would find the Old Testament to be a bummer of a read. It is my desire to, to, to teach the Old Testament to you, perhaps more importantly, to teach the Old Testament to my children, not as a story of moral essays. Let's make Joseph our hero. Let's make King David our hero. Let's make Moses our hero. My desire is not to teach the Old Testament in that sense as though it's a bunch of moral essays that show us how we should live, but rather... The story of the Old Testament time and time again is, is, a, is the story of how humanity is broken and though we try to get to God, we never get to God. Thus, God comes to us. He's a wooing, drawing, compelling, redemptive God. If that wasn't there, the Old Testament is a bummer. Let's see if we can find that today. This picture of a relentless, pursuing God throughout history. We see redemption in the life of Joseph. I'm going to unpack that for you. If I can just do a little like, um, one of my kids calls it a theological geek out. If I could just theologically geek out here for you a minute and just go a little deep. Drill down a little deeper than I maybe sometimes do theologically. Um, here in this passage, in the book of Genesis, what we find is Joseph being presented by the writer as a type of Christ. T-Y-P-E. A type of Christ. And a, 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 a foreshadowing. Remember that from your, from, 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 from your English lit class, I guess. Uh, foreshadowing. Joseph is a, a type of, a picture of, a foreshadowing of Jesus. Why do I say that? How do we see that? Well, Joseph is a savior of the world, a little s. A savior of the world. He saves them from famine. God determined that would be. Jesus Christ is the big S, savior of the world. Joseph was, uh, was, was mistreated and abused and rejected by his own people, his own brothers. Well, you recall, Jesus was abused and mistreated and rejected by his own people. Upon being rejected, Joseph did not ultimately say of his accusers, God strike them. God kill them. God, God make them pay. No, what he says is, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And, and Jesus, when he's on the cross, what does he say? He says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Joseph is a type of, he is, a, he is a representation of Jesus. Jesus and Joseph, they're both rescuers. I would call them uh, cosmic lifeguards. Like they're, they're on duty. They're ready and able to save. Their other, and with this I'll close out my, my theological geek out session. Uh, there, are other, uh, there are other types of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, I'm not even going to list them all, but we've looked at, at, at some of them. One would be Moses. I'm sorry, Moses is in Exodus. Uh, in the Old Testament, not just in the book of Genesis, but in the Old Testament, there are several. Uh, Noah, to some degree, would be a type. Um, Moses, um, I wrote some down. Uh, Samson, I know that sounds kind of weird, but he's, 
he's a type of, a representation of, a picture or a foreshadowing of Jesus. And, and then the, some would say that, that Job, actually, the story of Job, which is one of the most ancient stories in the Old Testament, that it's a, a type of, a picture of, a representation of Christ. So Joseph, a foreshadowing, a picture of what Christ is like. When the good news of redemption takes over, becomes the driving force, which it, it wasn't always, but when it becomes the driving force in Joseph's life, then he begins to, to live it out, to, to foreshadow, to represent Christ. Now, when, when, when someone is saved, when someone is redeemed, they are always saved from something. So, when someone is saved, perhaps they're saved from the ocean's current. Perhaps you've been, I know some of you have, have been dragged out by the weird currents of the gulf. And then you must be rescued, you must be saved. Because when you're saved, it requires being saved from something. Maybe saved from the ocean's current. Maybe, maybe saved from the flames of the house fire. Maybe saved from the addiction to a drug or many drugs. Something, I'm going to change words here now. Something must be defeated in order for someone to be set free. Something must be defeated in order for a person to be saved or redeemed or bought back. This price is paid and you're bought back and you are saved from something. So, I want us to th talk for the rest of our time together. What does Jesus redeem us from? There are things that he redeems us from that aren't in Joseph's story. I'll only give you one example. We were just talking about it in, in our gospel community, our small group last night. Something that Jesus redeems you from, um, something that Jesus defeats, is regret. There's a room full of regret here. I know, because you're like me, and I'm like you, way more than you think I am. And, and so we all have regrets. And and that's backward looking. And we're all guilty people. Like we've hurt each other. We've, we, have, we have hurt our loved ones. We have, we have hurt those who are the dearest to us. We have sinned against God. We're just all guilty. It's, it's okay to admit that. But one of the things that Jesus did on the cross was he defeated your regret. Because as Paul tells us, in Christ... You're a new creation. And then what does he go on and he says? He says, he says, the old has passed away. And the new has come. That's not just talk, friend. That is the reality of the gospel. What, what God is saying to you through Paul is, you don't have to regret. Like we think, you know, I know that he forgave, forgave me, but I should still feel bad about it. And, and God says, no, honest truth Jesus defeats regret. You're, you're scot-free. You're, you're, you're let off the hook. You don't have to regret any longer. Move forward with conviction regarding how you're going to live in the future. But don't regret your past. You needn't. Okay. But in the story of Joseph... What does Jesus defeat? He defeats these, and what does Jesus defeat? He defeats these four things. He defeats many. Perhaps the list would be, I don't know. It'd be very long. But these are the four things that we're going to look at. Jesus defeats hate. Jesus defeats paybacks. Fear and dishonesty. And oppression. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move quick on this one. Number one, Jesus defeats hate. That'd be hostility. There'd be animosity, which is like the, the deepest, most profound level of hostility. Jesus defeats that. In verse 15, the brothers say to one another, Joseph hates us. He must hate us. And now that dad's gone, he is going to 
pay us back for all the wrong we have done. And frankly, that seems right, doesn't it? It seems like Joseph should do something about this. It seems as though he should uh, act out on his hostility, act out his animosity, his hatred toward his brothers. But see, that is not the way of Joseph, and that is not the way of Christ. Jesus came to the earth to defeat hate. It's said in the Bible that, that, that Jesus came to, to destroy the walls of hostility that divide us. Ephesians 2 says that. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Jesus defeats the wall of hostility. And therefore, if you call yourself a Christ follower, if you say that you adhere to the teachings of Jesus, if you would say that you have come under, you have submitted yourself to the Lordship of Jesus, then you are obligated to be a person who lives this out, who breaks down the walls of hostility. Therefore, if you are condoning hostility in your own home, if you are promoting hatred and animosity in your place of work, or dare I say, in, in today's uh, political scene where, where animosity uh, abounds, if you cheer for that, if you hold to that, then you are working at cross purposes with Jesus Christ. He came to defeat hate, to defeat hostility, to end animosity. As the passage says, get this, how relevant is this? Between the Jews and the non-Jews. I, I, I feel this passionately because I feel it personally. What I mean by that is I struggle with animosity, with hostility, with aggression myself. I, I, I'm going to tell you a story. I, I, was, I, was, um, I was out. Do you all know I'm a, I'm a fisherman? I'm an angler. I, I guide some on the, on the side. I used to guide a lot. Fly fisherman out on the bay. And me uh, and my, my, my daughters are good fishermen, but my boys take it very seriously. So me and my boys, my three sons, a few years ago, we were out and we wanted Truett, my oldest. We were, we were fishing the Tift, the Texas International Fishing Tournament. And we wanted to win. I mean, he would win, but we all kind of celebrated in the joy because I'm the guide and he's the angler. And, and, and it's not like we didn't have a chance. The year before, we, Truett had won second place in the fly fishing division, but we hadn't, um, he hadn't won first place yet. So that was our goal. So we pre-fished the day before or days before. We fished hard all summer finding large trophy trout because that's the key. And we had determined that we were going to get out super early. We're not going to break the rules. So we're going to sit on the water and wait till 6.30 because that's when you can officially fish. And we're going to sit there and stake out our spot in the middle of the dark on this shoreline right off the intercoastal where the big trout are. And we're waiting patiently and we're doing the right thing and we're legal. And then this big old dummy in his big old scooter comes, comes down, the, down the intercoastal and then he turns and he blows up our shoreline and then I'm like, we're like 60 feet. We're holding the boat. We're waiting for the right time and we're like 60 feet off the shoreline which is where all the good fishing is. The shoreline is important. And then in his scooter he blows right through, right between our boat and the shoreline right through. Now, he, I, I, you gotta understand, he was in the wrong. Like, like, you just don't, you don't do that, all right? So, it was me and Truett, it was a few years ago, and it was Nolan. At the time, he was probably, he's 13, he was probably 10. And what came out of my mouth that day, you see where I'm going with this, um, it, 
it uh, it shocked Nolan. Truett, he, Truett's not shocked by much, but but uh, so I wrote it down. Here's what I did. I at the top of my voice, uh, maybe maybe with a uh, a a fist clenched. I said this, I wrote it down so I could get it right. I yelled this, the top of my voice, I can guarantee you heard me. I yelled, I'll find you later. That's what I said. All right, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's me. I think it's Judah clapping. Thank you, Judah. Um, <laughs> A lot that someone would, 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 would applaud that. Yes. Um, like I went all Chris Como on the guy, right? Um, <laughs> and that day, I went home and I did some soul searching. You know, Nothing ever comes out of a drunk man's mouth, and I wasn't drunk, but wasn't even drinking, but nothing comes out of a drunk man's mouth that wasn't there in the first place. You follow me? Yeah. So I went home and I, I did some soul searching. Like, where does that hostility? I didn't go find him later, by the way, just so you know. Uh, but I, I, I could have, uh, but I didn't, I didn't. Uh, I went home and did some soul searching because that's not the way of Christ. Christ came to defeat that hostility. He came to, to cut that out and, and root that out and to save me from that. So I would just ask as we get ready to move on to the next item, are you promoting hate in any way? Are you watching hate on TV? Are you listening to it on the airwaves? There's just no place for aggression and hostility in our lives. Not if we're submitting our lives to Christ. There's just no place for that. Jesus said this, and it's the basis for our um, sermon and campaign during the entire uh, fall. He, Jesus said this, and this is the basis for our Community Matters campaign. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Imagine 12 Jewish men, by then 11 Jewish men, who've been following 10 commandments all their lives. And he says, a new commandment I give to you. <clears throat> that you love one another. By this we'll all know that you are my disciples. Jesus came to defeat hatred. Jesus came to defeat paybacks. Very similar, right? Retribution. Revenge. Retaliation. Who has the right to paybacks? Well, in, in, in this world's economy, in this world's system, the person that was wronged. In, in, in this world's system, if you're hurt, then you have a right to payback. Like an eye for an eye, right? You can even extrapolate that from Scripture somehow and say, see, this even proves uh, that I, I have the right to retaliate. So if your spouse hurts you, you have the right to pay back. If your boss defames you, you have the right to pay back. But see, in God's system, in God's economy, only God has the right to retribution. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You've probably heard that. Romans 12. It's several places in Scripture, but the New Testament reference to it. Romans 12. Blessed, or I'm sorry, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, and then it's an Old, Test Old Testament reference, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Paul says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become, I'm sorry, do not be overcome by evil. 
but overcome evil with good. What's God saying here? Is he saying, look, look, watch this. Like, I will zap him way better than you can. You let me take care of it, and I'll get him good. I, I don't think that's what God is saying. I think what God is saying is that's not our business. Does God avenge the, 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 the sins and the wrongs of the human race? He does. He does. Is God just? He is. Is that our worry? Is that our concern? It's not. We're not even to take comfort in the fact that one day they will suffer. That God will one day avenge all they've done and, and they will... We're not even to take comfort in that. No, God is saying this. God is saying, trust me, I will do what is right. I always do what is right. If you think, if I think that my anger is based on the fact that I hate wrongdoing, God says, don't worry about that. Like, I always do what is right. I always... Meet out justice. You, need, you not, need not worry about that. But usually our anger isn't righteous. It's not committed to um, the, 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 the righting of wrongdoing. Usually our, our anger is just based out of our own sense of personally being inconvenienced or embarrassed. God says, I'm always about doing what is right. That is my job. Listen, friends. This may sound sappy, but it is, it is in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. Our most powerful weapon against evil is good. There are people who owe you. There are people who have done you wrong, have sullied your name, they've taken advantage of you, and so I ask you, right, us, right here, are you keeping a ledger, an account, an IOU? Except it's, a, it's not an IOU, it's a, it's a Y-O-M, a you owe me. Forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to keep a record any longer. I'm not going to keep a record of, of his wrongdoings any longer. I'm forgiving I'm forgiving him. She doesn't owe me. It's all done. I've told some of you a story that, that many years ago, um, in a business dealing that I had when I was in Albuquerque, through no wrongdoing of my own, it, 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 it came to a point where um, someone was indebted to me for an amount of money that in my uh, in my uh, in, in the little economy of my life, it was a, it was a lot of money, and and um, and he it, he didn't pay me, and, it, and and God made it clear to me that in that instance I was not supposed to keep a ledger, and, and I'm not saying this is just a rule like across the board when people owe you that you shouldn't uh, seek payment. That's not what I'm saying. But in my case, at that moment in time. This was a brother in Christ, and God told me, keep, uh, no longer keep a running tally. Act as though um, it's all done. Don't be your own collection agency. That's kind of what God was saying to me. And, you know, I was really freed up at that point in my life from worry. I had been, I'd been kind of sick about it, but I decided, God just told me not to worry about it, so I'm just going to let it go. Now, financial um, IOUs, are easy to forgive. But some of you have been wronged emotionally and, and physically, in, 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 in some cases in, in hideous ways. In verse 19, Joseph says, do not, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Joseph knows retribution, that's not my responsibility. That's God's doing. I'm not God. And then in verse 21, Joseph says, it says that he comforted them. And he, he spoke kindly to them. 
Are you waiting to achieve a payback? Jesus defeats that. Give that to Jesus. He will defeat that. Third thing that Jesus came to defeat is fear and animosity. Fear and dishonesty, rather. Fear and dishonesty. Do you ever wonder why you personally are such a dishonest person? Did, did he just say that? Um, do you ever wonder the reason why you tell seeming, seemingly innocent lies? It's your fear. It, Jesus went to the cross to defeat your fear, to redeem you from the prison walls of your fear. Most of, in this, most of us in this room, when we lie, we lie because of fear. In, in reading verses 16 through 18, I see these brothers, they're relying on their old ways, their manipulative ways, their controlling ways of dealing with conflict. And we, we have those ways in us as well. These old, manipulative, controlling ways of dealing with conflict. It's just born out of dishonesty. Now they say, Dad, Dad said you should forgive us right before he died. Now, I don't know uh, it, if that's true or if that's not true, S certainly, you know, clearly their dad uh, would have wanted this. Did he say it on his deathbed? I don't know. The point is, they're trying to manipulate the emotions of the moment. And we do this, right? Like they're trying to, like, dad just died. Let's use the emotions for our benefit. And we do this. And, and, and Joseph clearly sees that because he's broken to tears that his brothers still don't trust him. And the brothers are still using their, their emotional ploys, you know, their, their little games, like to dig into this fresh wound of daddy's death to get at him. And I would ask you, don't answer out loud, but I would ask you, are you manipulative? Jesus came to defeat that. Bullies are driven by fear. The biggest bully you've ever known, I'll guarantee you, he is racked by fear. She's controlled by her fears. Are you emotionally controlling with your words? Do you say things that you know aren't true, but you're just saying it to, to play a game? And when you take that path, you're being dishonest. You're, it's born out of fear. <clears throat> this manipulation, this dishonesty, trying to control you, and cry, trying to, to play the field and, and shift, the, shift it in my direction. Dear friend, Jesus went to the cross to defeat your fear, to defeat your dishonesty. Won't you give that up to him today? The last thing I want to talk about today is that Jesus defeats oppression. Oppression. Mistreatment of the vulnerable, and the helpless, the outcast, the picked upon, the defenseless, The one who can't take care of himself, the widow, the wanderer. Jesus came to defeat oppression. <clears throat> What's going on here is the brothers, the 11 brothers, they are willing to merely be slaves. It's like when the... Uh, when the wayward son in the parable that Jesus tells, when he comes back and he says, Look, Dad, I no longer am worthy to be your son. I just want to be your slave. Because your slaves got it better than I do. 
and the father will have none of that. Well, in this story as well, the, the, the brothers say, Joseph, we'll just serve you as slaves. Uh, but he's having nothing of it. I love the fact that in verse 21, it says that he speaks kindly to, to the children, to his nieces and nephews. Joseph speaks kindly to their little ones, the brothers' children. No, um, <clears throat> a master over slaves, a master doesn't speak kindly to the slaves' children for fear of growing too close. But what Joseph's saying is, you're not my servants, you're my family. Jesus came to make the church a family. No slave, no free man, no Jew, no Gentile, no man, no woman. What does it, this mean? Does this mean that we give up our identity? No. What it means is we don't have a caste system. We don't play favorites. We don't have the more important and the less important. It means that we are adopted children, not slaves serving at the, the mercy of a harsh taskmaster. Galatians 20, uh, 3 says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. God is not your harsh taskmaster. I think we must get over this false picture of God that, that he, he believes we owe him. And that he is, he is harsh toward us. He doesn't want something from you. Can I say that again? God doesn't want something from you. He has something for you. He has sonship, S-O-N-S-H-I-P. He has adoption. The story of the Bible, the story of the Bible is true and deep reconciliation. The salvation of the lost. In the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's <clears throat> restoration. It's Reconciliation. It is, it, is, it is the restoration of friendly relationships. There used to be animosity, but now it's friendly. It's familial. Last thing and we'll pray. A few years ago, me and a good, a good friend of mine, uh, we, I helped him uh, a, Build some some really really awesome fences. It's out on a ranch, um, and it's 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 beautifully difficult work. If you've never if you've ever built fences um, out in the country, like that will that will contain cattle, like it's it's hard work. It's beautiful work. It's difficult work. But if you'll think with me for just a moment. The phrase, mending fences. Jesus, in his work on the cross, made it possible for us to be fence menders. The fact is, every one of us, we have relationships that need mending. Every one of us, we have friendships and family relationships that need to be worked on. Thankfully, some of them have been mended. Sadly, in this lifetime, on this earth, <clears throat> some of them never will be. But what I would ask you, as we prepare to come to the table of communion, are you doing the tough work of, of reconciliation in your own broken relationships today? Are you doing the work of reconciliation in this lost and broken world that we live in today? <clears throat> if you are a representative of Jesus, if you say, I follow the teachings of Jesus, I come under the lordship of Jesus, I submit to Jesus, then you are obligated to, to be a reconciler, to do the work of reconciliation. Are you opposing 
Jesus? Are you, in fact, working against Jesus? He invites us today to be reconcilers. He invites us today to be redeemers. He invites us today to, in our own world, in a, in a, in a sense, be our own little type representative of Jesus. To represent, to, to emulate, to live out the, the saving work of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus invites you to today. Not, not me, it's what Jesus invites you to today. Let's bow our heads and pray.